Welcome to the Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration here at uh, Houston Methodist Research Institute. Uh, today we're going to be hearing uh, a great talk on bioinformatics and cardiovascular and its cardiovascular applications from Dr. Kaifu Chen. Uh, Dr. Chen is director of our new CV Squared, which is the Center for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology. Uh, Dr. Kaifu Chen came to us from Baylor, uh, where he was an instructor and uh, came to our Center for Cardiovascular Generation uh, to become the sharp tip of our spear of uh, biology. His computational biology has really elevated our game, and today he's going to give us an introduction into bioinformatics for cardiovascular research. Thank you, Kaifu. So, uh, thank you for the very nice So, um, uh, today I'm going to introduce some very basic uh, uh, some brief introduction into uh, bioinformatics, and I will give some example how we use it for uh, cardiovascular research. So first, I would like to introduce uh, very simply what is bioinformatics. I try to revise this uh, talk to be uh, feel simple to people who are not bioinformatics. So hopefully, uh, you will like it. So. Uh, um, Basically, uh, many bioinformatics people, especially in the bioinformatics community, now we think there are three major types of uh, bioinformatic persons. Because <coughs> uh, if you simply talk about bioinformatics, it's a very broad concept. Actually, we meet many people who uh, tell us they are also doing bioinformatics. Sometimes you are really hard to say what is bioinformatics. But generally, we think there are three, three types, always call it the three tiers of bioinformatics. So the first tier is relatively uh, 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 easier uh, because uh, uh, at this level, uh, typically people uh, they are familiar with many bioinformatic tools or bioinformatic methods, so that they utilize these uh, <coughs> existing bioinformatic tools to analyze uh, genomic data, typically for <coughs> sorry, analyze data generated by collaborators. So, uh, so we call this type of uh, base, uh, very uh, junior data analyst. So for the data analyst, typically uh, uh, we think uh, to be a good data analyst, you need probably at least uh, some two to three years. Tools. But they will also develop better bioinformatic tools or new uh, softwares to address uh, a problem that might already have some software to address, but uh, uh, the software are not good enough, so they develop their new softwares. So uh, for this uh, group of bioinformatics, they always have, uh, typically they will have something like more than five years experience. Uh, they will be very familiar with data, and also they have a very strong background with uh, mathematics, statistics, computational sciences, and so on. And at this level, they typically they, they, they will be ready to uh, uh, develop their own projects, their bioinformatics projects, to write ground communication as a PI and so on. So typically, this is uh, uh, at the postdoc or post after postdoc levels. So the third tier, we generally think uh, uh, they need much more uh, appearances. So they we. I would call them computational biologists because they are not only computational people, at the same time they must also be a biologist, which means they must know biology very well. So the difference between this third tier and the second tier is that they will develop software, but they are develop software not only for existing or established biology problem. They, because they know biology very well, so they can identify larval biology problems that never have any software to address these type of problems. So they identify a larval biology problem, and then because it's a larval problem, there's no existing software to address it. So they develop the first software to address this type of uh, problems. So you can say they, their job might be have high, the highest larval teeth and so on. So based on my understanding, this type of biology, computational biology, they typically need something like more than 10 years of appearances to, to be expert in both biology and uh, computational uh, sciences. So uh, actually, bioinformatics have a very, very long history. 
So I guess everybody here knows these three people, right? So they are Craig, Watson, and uh, Wilkins. And they uh, discovered the double helix structure of DNAs. But uh, I guess many people know, 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 know these three people, but uh, probably uh, don't know the other person who are really, really very important uh, to this discovery. And many people say this fourth person should also go to Nobel Prize. So her name is Franklin. So basically, Franklin generated the data that was analyzed by Craig, Watson, and Wilkins. But uh, surprisingly, Nobel Prize only gave to these three persons. So I will show you uh, why. And uh, I, I'm introducing this story that uh, was uh, right down in the Wik uh, Wikipedia. I didn't uh, create this story, OK? So, so basically, Franklin generated the data, but has been put it aside, put the data aside for something like one year. Uh, we don't know what's the exact reason, but the data he has been generated, she has been generated, she has generated the data, put it for one year. And then one year later, they said he move, she is moving her lab to some other places. So then she transferred the data to Wilkins. So what the Wilkins do? Wilkins showed the data to Craig and Watson. And then of course, Watson and Craig analyzed the data. Uh, a little bit of background, I think Crick is a physics background, right? And uh, uh, Watson is a chemistry background. Actually, Franklin is also kind of a chemistry background. So Crick and Watson analyze the data and also analyze some other data. Basically, they analyze the public data and they make the discovery. Then they show the result to uh, Wilkins. Then Wilkins, what Wilkins do is he uh, test the result, verify the result, and uh, also make some correction to the model discovered by uh, Crick and Watson. So I think this, uh, is, this is a very interesting story. So Franklin generated the data, but he didn't uh, make the discovery from the analysis of the data. Then Franklin uh, also, Franklin gets the data, but what he do is, uh, he found two experts who are really strong in data analysis. Data analysis. So they collaborate. They collaborate together to make the discovery. And also, he tests the model and help improve the models. So I think the, the, the collaboration between these different group of person with different appetites is, is very important to these discoveries. So uh, another uh, uh, gr uh, good example for uh, bioinformatics is uh, 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 these three people who won the Nobel Prize in 2013. So you can say this, this, is also not, uh, this title is also not uh, provided by me. It's provided by the New York Times. Right? So look at the title, Without Test Tubes, Three People Won Nobels in Chemistry. So this is not typical, right? Because uh, in the past, if you think about a uh, uh, chemistry uh, scientist or biology scientist, you always think these people can live uh, with do research without uh, any wide bench, right? But now time is changing because uh, many science are becoming more and more data-driven sciences and become more and more quantitative. So. Uh, so why bioinformatics is getting, is, is getting important? Uh, if we go back uh, something like uh, uh, 20 years ago, 20 years ago we spent uh, three, mi $3 billion dollars to sequence one genome, one genome sequences. But now, do you guys know how, many, how much it costs to sequence one whole genome? At least less than $1,000. And people, some people are thinking they are, they are going towards $100 uh, ground, uh, $100 for one genome. So think of the price has dropped by something like one million fold, right? Dropped by one, at least one million fold. What does this mean? This means you can use the same number of funding to generate one million more data. And actually, I will show you later, it's true. So in 2010, uh, there is one article published in the Genome Medicines. Uh, the title is The $1,000 genome, $1, genome and then the $100,000 analysis. So uh, I'm not sure how 
how this this value will change now because this is uh, in 2010. That's 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we will 10 years ago, uh, uh, RNSEC will cost something like uh, about 1,000 to 2,000 uh, dollars. But now uh, RNSEC just cost uh, you something like 200 to 300 dollars. So which means uh, the, the, the ratio between the price for the assets and the, and the data license has probably changed, uh, continue to uh, change. So uh, this is an example of how many data we have now. So if you go to the GU database, I just uh, updated the number last night. Actually, actually Nini was a few surprised because when I updated this number, last time I put this number is something like half a year ago. At that time, it's still, still, it's still two, million, 2 million samples. And now it's already 3 million samples in GEO. So there are data for 3 million samples. And this sentence is also written by me. It's from a, a, from a paper published in 2013 in Monica Cell. So they said, these individual labs do not and typically cannot analyze every possible hypothesis supported by their data. So think about these three million samples are generated by many, many labs. These labs generate data, analyze it uh, for one paper, then submit the data to public database. And very few people analyze them again. But think about it, it's a genome-wide data. It contains so many information. So there are many hypotheses that can be you know, supported by this data, but they are not uh, reused effi efficiently. So for this reason, uh, for this reason, uh, uh, actually NIH is providing funding to specifically support repurpose or reuse of this data that has already existed in public, in public database. And also in uh, 2013, this paper said uh, now it has been the time to gain new insights from existing section data. You can generate breakthroughs without a peptide. So this is also the title of the of the artic, of the of the articles. So taking this together, so we think uh, the role of bioinformatics in, re, in, in research, especially in biomedical research, been changing very fast in the past twenty years. At the very beginning, in twenty years ago, bioinformatics is very dependent on white bunch that data because at that time you have very few public data to use. But now time is changed. So 10 years ago when I started to do bioinformatics, or 15 years ago. So this is very typical at the left side. So our collaborator generates new data. And sometimes I even generate new data by myself. And then we develop some bioinformatic method to analyze data. Because at that time, there are very few methods to analyze this data. And sometimes you can do something very crazy. For example, I come from a physics institute. So I use the. Uh, some software, some algorithm that was in the past used to analyze the one two one one zero one zero one zero data to analyze this DNA sequence because I found DNA sequence very similar to this one zero one zero one zero. Basically, if you can if you convert AT into one and GC into zero, then it becomes electronic data. And then. Uh, Something like 10 years ago or five years ago, we start to note it's very important to revisit existing sequence data to gain novel insights, or at least combine the existing data with the new data to do analysis. Then about uh, also start from some like 10 years ago, I started found that uh, in addition to develop software and analyze data for my collaborator, I can analyze public data to do some research to prove some some some, some Level biological hypothesis. So that's, that's how we found the broad cable try and published it in this GITS paper. Basically, when we publish that story, we have no new white bunch result from, from, for that project. So I think in the future, this, uh, the model on the right side will become very popular too. So you can start from revisit existing sequence data. Basically, currently, most of the project that initiated by my lab is in this model. We revisit existing data to gain some lava insights, generate some hypothesis. Then we develop some, further develop some bioinformatics software or methods, and then we go to our white bunch collaborators to ask them to do some 
uh, necessary impairments to verify our hypothesis and so on. So, so now uh, uh, biophimatic person have more choice, and also I think white bunch person are also having more cho choice because there are much more software available now. Many of this software is very easy to use, especially this uh, this cloud computing based uh, database. So, for example, the C portal. I think every biologist will be very feel very easy to use the C portal to do many analysis by themselves. So now you can see some white bands, some white bands labs have their own biophysics personnel, and also some biophysics labs also have some of the have some white bands. So you can either do it by yourself, or you can collaborate. But this is my experience now, collaboration is still the mainstream in in, in this area. So uh, I think either collaboration or do it by yourself. Either way have its own advantage. For example, for collaboration, the benefit I think is if you communicate very well, you can do things much much faster, and it's always also doing better. But the challenge is in collaboration, it's very important to com communicate very well. You need very deep communication, always meeting, very open to discussion, and very well, very well need to share credit and so on. So that's uh, that's an advantage and a challenge for collaborations. And you can do it by yourself. The benefit is you have more freedom. And it's, uh, the management is much more simple. And uh, uh, you can also do it at whatever your time you want to do it. Because if you are collaborating, sometimes you really want to do it very fast, but your collaborator is maybe occupied by other projects. But the challenge is it's uh, always less efficient, because you need much more time to become an expert in the data, in the bioinformatics, and so on. And also, there is increased the risk of mistakes. I will introduce it. Uh, so uh, I will uh, tell my personal appearance, because I don't have too much data uh, concerning this. So before I joined this department, I, I think uh, before I joined, I negotiated with Dr. Cook, right? At that time, I think our agreement for me is uh, uh, I should put 75% uh, effort on collaboration. At the same time, I have 25% effort uh, to develop uh, uh, software, this biophysics project, and so on. So, and uh, 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 my commitment is to submit three grants every year. Uh, I think it's three NH grants every year, as a, either a PI or a co-PI. And uh, uh, I was supposed to also receive co-investor awards through these collaborations. So after. Sometimes 3.5 year, it turns out the result to be good. Uh, we do both collaboration and uh, biophysics projects. So we received something like uh, 15 grants, and uh, in two of these grants, we are the we are the PI or uh, the edition PI or counter PI. In two of these grants, we are something like multi PI, including uh, grants with Dr. Cook. And we have 10 co-investor awards with uh, collaborators in the inside uh, our department or outside the, our department or across the countries. And also we published uh, many papers, especially uh, through collaboration, we published many top uh, papers in top journals such as Nature and Science. So now uh, I think all these things I introduced are very general bioinformatics and to help people understand what is bioinformatics and how you can use bioinformatics collaborators for your own project and so on. So basically what, what my lab do is we develop bioinformatics techniques to study cell identity regulations. So we develop uh, something like uh, 24 softwares I think we have already developed. Some of these software are published as a methodology article, but many of them are published in our biological uh, uh, papers together with a biological story. For example, in recently, uh, in our collaboration with, uh, with, with Nongho, in a science paper, uh, we also developed some new methods for the data assays, and we put it as a software and released, in, just in case that uh, uh, other people in future can use the software that we have write it in the project. And also I would like to introduce uh, one case study. Uh, I introduced this story because it just happened in our department. And it's, I think it's a great success of collaborations. 
So basically what we do is in this project, we utilize the public uh, data to help uh, I call it the rescue of our, our, our really great manuscripts. So before we start this collaboration, I have already talked frequently with Nongho, and I know, I know they are doing a really great job, and uh, I know his science is very, very exciting. And one day, I think in, our, in one of our faculty meetings, Nongho said, uh, uh, unfortunately, his manuscript is rejected again by, by, by science. And then we continue discussion, and then we think, we, we, we said, why, why don't we just, uh, you know, address the concern of this reviewer, and then appeal to the editor to say whether we can re resubmit it. So it's rejected, uh, I think it's rejected by, uh, by nature too. It's, it's initially rejected by nature and uh, science after first round review. But the good thing is sent out, it is sent out for review by both nature and uh, science, which means this editor really like it. So it's really a great uh, uh, manuscript, right? So then uh, Nongho appealed and uh, uh, we did this biophimatic and uh, did many other uh, wide bunch experiments and his collaborator in China also generated some uh, data from human samples and so on. And then uh, we uh, uh, were invited to uh, resubmit uh, the manuscript to science and finally it uh, gets uh, uh, accepted for meta revision after the second round of review. So uh, why we use uh, why we use uh, public data to 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 to, to do the uh, analysis and address the concern? Um, basically, the first the reverse concern related to this bioinformatic work is uh, they want to know whether the SRPP2 regulates the notch related pathway at the genome wide scale. Nongho has already has solid data to show that uh, SRPP2 can write, can regulate notch related pathways. But this reviewer just wanted to see it at a genome wide scale. So, to, to do it at a genome wide scale, basically the first thing you want to do is a chip seek. Right, just do a chip seek for this SRPP2. But unfortunately, this chip seek requirement for SRPP2 is very difficult because SRPP2 is not a very famous uh, transcription factor. So, for a chip seek to be a success, you need uh, many important factors, including very good antibody. And uh, you also require very uh, 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 tight binding between transcriptor and the quarantine. So I think uh, uh, Nongho's group has been doing the experiments very, very uh, 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 well, and they are excellent in these experiments. But unfortunately, for this factor, very few people succeed in the chipsec. But there do exist uh, one public chipsec data that has been generated by a lab. So then we think, why don't we just design some bioinformatics uh, analysis to utilize this public data to address the reviewers con answer the reviewers' questions? Mm -hmm. So what we, ut uh, we utilize is uh, uh, chip seek data for, SR for SREBP2 from mouse, from mouse levels. It's not from the cell line that, from that we are investigating, because Nongho is investigating uh, SRPP2 in and the senior cell in hematopoietic uh, uh, stand and progenitor cell and so on. But at least uh, uh, it's a chip seek data at a genome wide scale. And uh, this binding site for transcription factor always have a significant overlap in different uh, data sets. And also, Nongho uh, uh, generates the uh, attack seek data for uh, the hematopoietic and the uh, hemogenic and the senior cells. So, try to combine these data together. So, uh, for, for example, here you can see at the notch promoter, right? You can see there is a very clear peak. This, there is a very clear peak uh, of chip seek, uh, of SRP2 chip seek uh, singular, right? Which means it's probably bound to this promoter in the liver. So, then we want to know whether it's also bound to uh, uh, this uh, promoter in the homogenic and the senior cells. So from the ataxic data, you can say there is an enrichment peak, which means the binding site for SRB2 is at least has been open, has been accessible to transcription factors. So this is a good science. So then next, we uh, utilize the data and the GA in my group uh, uh, defined a binding motif for uh, SRB2 based on this uh, uh, public chip seek data. And as a verification, he found uh, that uh, this motif is uh, highly enriched uh, 
uh, in the uh, chip-seek enrichment peak for SRPP tools. And you can see the more, the, the more stringent the cutoff we use to define the peaks, the more, enrich, uh, the more enrichment we observe for this uh, motif, which means this motif is a, a reliable motif for the binding of SRPP tools. So we analyzed whether the SRPP2 binding motif really overlap with this uh, enrichment peak in the ataxic data, which we indicate if it's enriched, which means this binding motif has been open, has, has been accessible to transcription factors, right? So we observed a very significant overlap. Actually, we observed the 40% uh, 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 overlap of the binding motif with the ataxic uh, uh, peaks. And uh, from this figure, from the figure on the right, you can see very clearly that the, uh, the, the, the binding motif is highly enriched and overlap with the enriching peak of the ataxic data. So we further analyzed why the, uh, the binding motif, this binding motif for SRPP2 is enriched, uh, <laughs> is enriched in the genes that are up or down regulated during endothelial to hematopoietic stem cell differentiation, because long ago already have preliminary data to show that the SRPP2 play a key role in the endothelial cell to hematopoietic stem cell uh, differentiation. So we do observe that the binding motif for SRP2 are enriched in both the upregulated and the downregulated genes. When you compare the uh, uh, either endothelial cell to the homogenic endothelial cell, or when you compare homogenic endothelial cell to hematopoietic stem cells. Because the differentiation happens from endothelial cell to homogenic endothelial cell, and then to hematopoietic stem cells. So next we uh, found uh, that, uh, uh, <coughs> actually the binding motif for SRP2 uh, on the large promoter is highly conserved in different species from mouse to uh, human and to uh, zebra fishes. So we uh, defined the, uh, the binding sites or the binding motif for uh, SRP2 in all these species. And then uh, Chinin performed the experiments to verify uh, that the SRP2 uh, did bind to the binding motif for uh, SRP2 on the large promoters. So you can say he uh, performed the experiments on uh, two binding sites of uh, uh, two binding sites in the promoter region of uh, notch one B, and also uh, in the, uh, the other gene IDLR, and uh, uh, his his result indicates that uh, it's true that uh, uh, SRB two does bind to these three binding sites. And as a negative control, when he performed the chip of PSR, chip of PSR in a long binding site, he didn't see an enrichment. So Chinese experiment successfully verified the binding sites defined by this biomatic analysis. Also, we uh, uh, analyzed the enriched pathways for the gene that associated with the binding motif for SRP2, and found that actually this gene are highly enriched in large signaling pathways and also in cholesterol metabolic pathways and uh, 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 many other related pathways. So which this also indicates that the, the binding motif for SRP2 is really uh, tends to regulate this gene in the large related pathways. So after we perform this motif analysis, then we, we think, you know, uh, because motif analysis, is, motif is not specific to cell type, right, suppose. Because if SRP is binding this motif, this motif exists exist in the genome. It's not cell type specific. So we first analyze the motif. Then next we think maybe we can also reproduce the result using the chip seek data, although the chip seek data is from liver. But there should be significant overlap between the binding sites for SRP2 in the liver sample and in the endothelial lineage. So from this chip seek data, you can say that uh, SRPV2 do have a binding site in the, for example, uh, on the promoter of itself, and also uh, in the promoter of, of these genes. And from the ataxic data, you can say that there is exact overlap between the ataxic peak and the SRPV2 chip seek enrichment peaks. And further, um, 
Chinese, uh, Chinese department also verified uh, the binding of SRBP2 on, the, uh, on these binding sites defined by CHIP-seq data from the liver samples. So next, we also analyze the pathway for the enriched pathway for the gene associated with the CHIP-seq binding peak uh, for SRBP2 in the liver. Actually, we found uh, uh, the CHIP-seq data from the liver show enrichment in these uh, uh, large uh, or cholesterol-related pathways. You can say on the top is cholesterol-related pathway, on the bottom is large related pathways. And next, like, so we also found that the binding site, the binding peaks for SRPV2 are highly enriched in genes that are up or down-regulated in, uh, in the gene up or down-regulated when you compare endothelial cell to homogenic endothelial cell or when you compare homogenic endothelial cell to hematopoietic stem cells. And also, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, also, we found uh, the, the binding sites defined by chipstick data in liver are actually uh, overall is uh, open in the, uh, uh, in the endothelial cell lineage because uh, you can see that you get that overlap between the chipstick enrichment peak and the ataxic enrichment peak, and the overlap is up to uh, 80%. So finally, we also analyzed, uh, as I showed, I ana we also analyzed the RNA-seq data uh, uh, com uh, in endothelial cell in comparison to hematopoietic progenitor cells. And you can see we, we can define uh, 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 700 to 1,000 uh, up or down-regulated genes. And, uh, 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 Chinese department, Chinese RT QPSA department also verified the up or down regulation of these genes, including the notch, uh, the notch one genes. So I, before I uh, prepare for this talk, I really uh, want to prepare another story in which uh, you will say. Uh, white bunch experiments can other experiments to collaborate and help rescue uh, important biophysics manuscripts. Uh, unfortunately, due to time limit and uh, because uh, our important manuscripts are all not published yet, so hopefully we, we uh, I or some of you in future can also show some example uh, how white bunch can also collaborate with biophysics lab to do some experiments and to help biophysics to rescue some important project projects that are supposed to be published in top journal but uh, are rejected due to you know due to uh, incomplete techniques to study this project because uh, I think now if you want to uh, fully support your hypothesis you always need both biophysical data and wide bunch experiments I think both are very important for a great uh, research project so I uh, will not introduce it here. So uh, finally, I would like to uh, 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 put something that I always talk outside. So what I said is uh, I encourage collaboration, but at the same time, I also encourage to do bioinformatics, white bunch do some bioinformatics, and also uh, bioinformatic group do some white bunch. But uh, we really need to, need to emphasize if you decide to do it, no matter through collaboration or do it by yourself. We need to be very careful with this biophysical research because uh, uh, just remember two very basic facts. Uh, biophysical is sometimes a little bit different from white bunch. For example, for white bunch, I know after publication, you always uh, deploy your cell line or deploy many important material to public uh, uh, organization or public database, right? But biophysical is even, is even more strict because Whenever you publish your data, publish your results, you must publish your raw data. If you don't publish your raw data, your paper can get rejected because of that. So your raw data must be published. And very important is in future, more and more researchers will start to reanalyze these raw data. They will reproduce your results to verify some uh, uh, important uh, hypothesis. So this has happened multiple times in the past, right? So a lab A generates their raw data, very, very exciting, profound analysis, and found a very exciting hypothesis. And they also validate their result, sometimes even with many other white bunch experiments. And then 
publish their data and the conclusion in very top journal. For example, there is example in Cell in Nature. This paper they are published in Nature and Cell. So they have been revealed very strictly right in these uh, top journals. So when they get published, very exciting, right? And then one day, let B reanalyze the same published data due to many reasons. For example, for example, in our case, in one of our paper, we are required by the reviewer to analyze the data and reproduce the results generated in a cell papers. And then finally, these people found that uh, their conclusion is different. Right? Based on the same data, doing the same analysis, they reached two different conclusions. So then what they can do? The first thing they will do is always to contact the lab A, right? Contact lab A, then lab A always, uh, most time lab A will get nervous. They will immediately recheck their analysis and so on. And uh, this happened sometime. The lab A found and confirmed that they analyzed data in a wrong way. For example, sometimes they just use a different uh, statistical method. For example, in our case, the lab should use uh, Spearman correlation, but actually they use, the they, they use the Pearson correlation. So they are very different. Pearson correlation should use on data that uh, have a linear, linear correlation to each other. But for Spearman correlation, they can detect correlation that don't have a linear correlation, but have rank correlations. So anyway, so lab A found that they analyzed the data in a wrong way. So what, can, what you can do now? So the lab A then sometimes have to retract their publication, or sometimes correct their publication. Anyway, it's not, uh, you know, feel not good right, to, to find these things happen. Then lab B, what, what we say is lab B publishes their new data, publishes their, their new conclusion based on the same raw data. And uh, one example I say is uh, a very famous lab generates the data published the paper in Nature. And then two years later, another lab found they analyzed the data in the wrong way. So then lab A retracted their paper from Nature. Then the lab B published the paper in the Nature. So published in the same journal based on the same data. So try to avoid this. So, uh, so our suggestion is, uh, um, for if if you are really need bioinformatics, or if you really want to do bioinformatics, I think there are multiple ways you can do. So you can either collaborate with the real experts, or spend enough efforts to become an expert to really know what we are doing. And also, there are many other important things. For example, um, especially always be sure to use the right statistical method and use the right tools in the right ways. And also, always keep a copy of your the software you use, because this software they keep updating, keep updating, keep updating. Maybe one day you even forget which version you use. So always keep a copy of the software and keep a copy of the parameter scripts that are using, command line that are using, uh, keep important files, especially these, uh, mid, uh, these, uh, these final stage uh, files, such as uh, gene pressure level, chip seek enrichment peak, and so on. And always run, rerun your pipeline multiple times before you publish your results. At, at least for me, I always rerun my pipeline two or three times to make sure these results are highly reproducible. So finally, I would like to appreciate uh, uh, Sorry, we cannot show this in the uh, in the slides. Uh, I would like to appreciate uh, uh, our center, especially uh, uh, our department. Um, without uh, without this very comprehensive, deep collaboration with uh, our wide bunch collaborators here, we will not be able to make many of our uh, uh, discoveries in the center, especially. Uh, for example, uh, I think uh, Shumong in Dr. Cook's lab has been collaborating a lot with us. And uh, uh, Qin in Dr. Long, in Dr. Fang's lab has been collaborating with us. So not only we help them analyze the data, at the same time, they also help us generate the many uh, results based on wide bunch experiments. This is really, really very important to us. And uh, finally, I would like to appreciate everybody in my group. Uh, they are really fantastic. 
Uh, it's amazing. Many of them uh, are perform much, much better than what I expected when, I, when, when, when they joined this group. And uh, thank everybody. Thanks, Kaifu, for a, a great talk. You know, the, it's so important to have you here to help us uh, understand the huge amount of, of biological data that we're generating with RNA-seq and chip-seq. And, um, the, um, so we, we appreciate that. And you, you made the point that uh, public databases can also be very, very useful in testing hypotheses. And I've seen you do that uh, uh, very um, adeptly. Um, the, there is a problem, though, with public databases. Not all of the data is, is good. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the GEO database. Right. Um, there were two investigators that showed a few years ago mm -hmm. that 10 percent of the uh, transcriptional profiles from mammalian cells, from human and mouse uh, cell lines in the GEO database, 10 percent are contaminated mm -hmm. by mycoplasma, DNA. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that case, the, the transcriptional profiles of those cells are going to be abnormal because we all know what mycoplasma does to our cells, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what do you do? I mean, that's just one example of a corruption of data that's in the, in the, in the GEO database. But how do you um, uh, look for uh, what are the common problems that you face when you're going through public databases, and how do you correct for those? So uh, it's true that uh, this public data, some some of the data, for example, you said probably 10% of the data might have some problems. Actually, actually this happens not only to public data. Also, have, because these public data actually are deposited by this uh, lab that generates them. And actually, I can tell you, that's why I say, you do by mind, you really need to be very careful to, to make sure you really know these data very well. So we have, we have multiple experiments uh, in the past. For example, uh, I think the, the most simple experiments is uh, actually our collaborator, they send, out, uh, they send out a mouse sample for sequencing, and then they receive the human data. Huh. Uh, but this type of uh, mistake is very easy to find, right? Because when you analyze data, you find they cannot be mapped to mouse data. But we also, there is also time we found, actually, we, we send one cell, we send data, we send, uh, no, we send uh, uh, sample of one cell line to sequencing, and then when, they, when we receive the data, we found the data is not right, right? We found, uh, first we found the, the data we received, the raised number is doubled, so it's a little bit strange. And then we keep thinking why, and then when we follow, further analyze the data, we found that all the results does not make sense at all. So when we start to think, is there any mistake in the data? And one thing I can imagine is, is, that, is there any data from other sample that are put into our files? So because it's cell line data, right? We first check, it's, it's a human cell line. We checked whether this data is really from human. We found it's from human, actually. So, both, so it's from human, right? Same as no problem. And uh, the mapping percentage is also right. And then we still feel strange. So then we say, why, what, what we can do? Because it's a cell line data, so the, the, the DNA should be relatively pure, right? So, and you know that a different person have a different variation, have a we call it a SNP, right? So we say, if it's from the same cell line, this sequence data should have the same SNP, right? Same genetic variation, or at least the, we know cell lines also have some uh, heterogeneity between cell, but most of the SNP should be very similar, right? But initially, when we analyze the data, we found for every region, for almost every SNP in the, in the genome, for this specific data set, we found that half of the SNP belong to one type, and half of the SNP belong to one genotype, and the SNP in half of other regions belong to another genotype. So this is a very strong evidence <coughs> showing that the data is contaminated. Half of the reason in this data is contaminated. So fortunately, we identified it because we know this data and we have an appetite. We know we can use SNP to identify them. Based on my opinion, I never know people use this method to identify contaminations. So I guess we are probably the first to identify contamination in this way. And then it's further confirmed. We ask the company to sequence the sample again, same, sequence the same sample one more time. And then the second batch of data, sequence the same sample. When the data return, we found there is no contamina contamination anymore. 
So the contamination does not happen in a collaborator's lab, does not happen in the sample. It happens in the data analysis step in that company. Because when the company do sequence, they sequence multiple samples in the same lane, the data they need to divide this data. So the problem happens when they divide the data. The third contamination I identified when I was postdoc is uh, we sequenced the yeast data, right? We sequenced the yeast data, and we found the data just totally does not make sense. And uh, then I found uh, uh, something like 60% or 60% of the reads are from human. It's a yeast data. 60% are from human, right? So definitely it's contaminated. Then we want to further know how does the contamination happen? Why the human sample go into the yeast sample? Fortunately, so for the experiments, from the preparation of the sample to sequencing, there are only 2% doing the, these experiments. One is male, other, the other is female. <laughs> <laughs> so then we think now we can use the, the X chromosome and the Y chromosome to identify the contamination, right? <laughs> Fortunately, then we map this result to human genome and found the contamination ha actually come from the, the, the male. That was my bad. <laughs> 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 so then my, my collaborator, actually the male is my collaborator. So my collaborator improved his experiment. He wear this, this, this coat to prevent the contamination. Then the next time when he sent the data to us, there is no contamination anymore. So uh, right, to use this data, no matter your new data or public data, uh, we need to be very, very careful and uh, uh, pay attention to it and uh, discuss with people. Also, I think in one of Nongho's data, actually I didn't find the, the contamination, and Nongho actually analyzed the gene pressure value for each, for each gene individually, and finally he found all data, it's uh, and senior cell data. It's right in the data, and actually it's contaminated by heart sample. Huh. And then also the collaborator resync with the sample for here. There is no con contamination anymore. Any other questions for Kaifu? Um, you know, one of the things that we do. Oh, did you have a question? He, he has a question. Yeah, I. It's on, it's on. I wonder just. Uh, uh, do you think that every thing, every time I. Uh, read this uh, bioinformatics thing, I think. Do you mm -hmm. think it's uh, important to get this thing easier? Mm -hmm. I mean, like C power, mm -hmm. C bio power, everyone yeah. can use it. Order. You get a lot of things to detect uh, contamination, mm -hmm. microplasmid. Mm -hmm. Do you think make a UI or something for that? Make easier mm -hmm. because for if this thing is important, right. then it's there has market, yeah. you know. Everybody want their impulse and can be used. That they could mm -hmm. make good UI, but I never, right. almost never seen never any bioinformatics mm -hmm. make a good UI for software. Do you think yeah. it is, it is important? <laughs> it is uh, things need to do, or something? You can invest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's good, right? Yeah. yeah. Actually, we have been thinking about this. Uh, it's a little bit challenging because uh, based on our parent first, this contamination does not happen often. Uh, I, uh, I think in our, in our new data generated by Clarita, I think the contamination happens, the frequency is something like uh, probably 1%. 1%. Uh, still you can, they, they make a kit right. for the uh, sequencing the right. microsoprasmid. Right. Yeah, to detect it, they sell it. Right. You can make a software, like right. you can sell it too. Right. You can, uh, yeah, it's yeah. like a, it's like a right. detected kit, the same thing, right? So uh, the second reason is uh, these contaminations, they are always not general. They are very, case by case, always very different. The third suggestion is, um, I think it's important to develop such software. And I even think about, uh, if we do a, high, do a you know, systematic uh, recheck of all, of all the public data in the GU data, database, I'm not sure whether we can find uh, you know, some, some type of mistakes generated by sequencing companies or companies. For example, some of the mouse data might contain some human data and so on. But what I said, want to say is it's always easier to identify this type of contamination by adding some control in your sample. For example, uh, recently in Linux data, 
We also found uh, some problem, but problem we found out is uh, because he use, she used CRISPR Cas9 to knock out his sample, and as, at the same time, his control sample has an empty vector CRISPR Cas9. Actually, fortunately, the empty vector have a, so when you do CRISPR Cas9, you use uh, your sequence to replace the, replace a fragment in the vector. So for the control, the, con the, the vector sequence is in the sample, but in your local sample, the vector sequence should not be in the sample. So then this sequence from the vector serve as a kind of uh, spiking control, right? So based on this control, we also can identify that there are some mistakes. So what you can do is, for example, if you are sequencing a human sample, you can add some vector sequence or add some other sequence from other species into your sample. And uh, each sample you add some different samples, then it will be much easier to identify this type of mistake and so on. But still, there are some problems that you cannot identify based on this type of methods. Again, so this type of contamination do happen sometimes. But uh, most of the time, you can identify them when you are doing data analysis. Because you are doing very comp comprehensive analysis, and uh, if there is a mistake, you will, feel, you will find it's not right. And uh, if you really know data very well, you will find a good method to, to find them. Any other questions or comments? Um, I think actually that was a great suggestion. E, some, some um, uh, at the very least, uh, some uh, review. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a science nature review talking about what are the common errors, what are the common missteps in bioinformatics analyses right. and, and uh, how to avoid those. And I, I, I really like your idea of commercializing that <laughs> uh, <laughs> knowledge. Right. So very good. Right. Uh, thank you. That's a great idea. <laughs> thank you for uh, the comments and a great presentation, Kaifu. Mm -hmm. Thank you.